I'm recording now, and uh, so welcome to the Baby Boomer Parents Guide to Understanding Millennials and the Next Generation. I'm Brad Zalas, and we're just waiting on my co-host, Susie Miller. Um, I'm at my local Starbucks because I want you to see you can do a show anywhere on Blab. I apologize. We had so many technical problems this morning. Uh, you actually have to tell your uh, Blab before you begin what devices you want to use. So it's got like a master switch. So get ready. We're going to have fun. Let me send this out on Facebook. And we'll get everybody back in here. So, Brandon, since you're the first person on, any questions you want me to answer? <laughs> do do. Anyways, uh, boom, boom, boom. Whoops, I don't want to screw that up. So, here we go. We're starting over again. Ah, there's Susie. Hi, Susie. <laughs> and let me hit click. I think it did it right. Susie's about to join us. No guarantees. She should be coming in. Yay, Susie. So the reason I uh, started working with Susie is because um, Susie is a uh, psychologist. And um, ah, here we go. It's asking me again. Susie should be coming on. Uh, how parents can educate their kids on careers in 2015. We're going to talk about that. Can is you that hear Susie? me? Yes, I can. I can hear you and see you. Can you believe it? I apologize to our audience. We we tried to get this going. Now we're back on. So good. Holy snipes, Batman! <laughs> <laughs> well, we have All Brandon right. on. Good friend, Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Let me just grab my um, headset and make sure this one's working. Okay. This was bizarre. So was it? Like I couldn't. I couldn't hear you. That's okay. But, what it was okay. is. Um, Mike, when you go to launch a blab, it has a master uh, piece at the top that says, which devices do you want to use? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't reading one of my other devices. That was it. So here I Got am, ready, ready to go. Okay. So. so we're ready. Let me, hi, Brandon. Thanks for being patient. <laughs> Welcome to the baby, the baby Boomer Parents Guide to Understanding Millennials and the Next Generation. I'm Brad Zalas. I'm one of your co-hosts. I wrote the book Liquid Leadership, uh, which delves deeply into the millennial and Generation X and all the, the, the business side of the generational differences. <coughs> and my co-host is Susie Miller. Susie, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Susie Miller, the Better Relationship Coach, and I help people create better relationships in 30 days or less. I'm a former marriage and family therapist. I have three, count them, three millennials, 30, 28, and 25. He's kind of a cusper. And love helping people create better relationships, parents, marriages, and met Brad at a conference, and we just connected, uh, probably because we were two of the coolest people in the room versus the oldest yeah. people in the room, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that so is so we, true. Yeah, we were the coolest or the oldest or a little bit of both, maybe? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of both. And I'm also the author, I keep forgetting to say this, I'm the author of the best-selling book, Listen, Learn, Love, How to Dramatically Improve Your Relationships in 30 Days or Less. So that is pretty fun. Yes, it is. And uh, I, I think what was amazing is the way you and I started talking, because it was at a Jim Palmer Dream Business Academy, and I was asked to be a keynote speaker. And I was teaching a little bit about what I do with millennials. And I noticed, like Susie, you and I gravitated towards each other right away because, you know, you're into the relationship part. And I see okay. th these young people today as changing our world at such a level, um, that's why everybody's talking about it. And millennials themselves don't even know what the big deal is. Right. Uh, and and so I thought maybe maybe we could delve into you know like how we were raised as kids. Susie, what was your father like growing up? <laughs> <laughs> well, for starters, my father was from India uh, before partition. Grew up um, through all of partition. Ended up on the Pakistani side, but was in a 
Christian family, so that was kind of a wild thing for them. He came to the United States when he was 18 um, because education was what it was all about. You got an education, as many degrees as you could, and then you kind of made your way. Um, in India, he was very wealthy. He was from a very wealthy, high caste family, so very educated, um, very much in the realm of having you know, servants and just the whole life was very different. Came right. to America, married an American woman. So I grew up in a very patriarchal home, a very traditional home. You know, the, the deal was go to school, study hard, get good grades, get your degrees, and you can make something of your life. And so that was really how I grew up. And, you know, there's some great things about that. And there's some things that really, you know, kind of got me stuck in some perfectionism and stuff. So it's been an interesting journey coming out of that. I got married young, had kids young. So the reality of having their life and their world be a totally different trajectory than mine has been a really a growing experience for me. Right. Well, I'll tell my story. My, uh, my father was uh, the first generation of uh, hung Hungarian immigrants that came here to the United States and met over in like Hellertown, Pennsylvania, Lancaster and around there. And um, so I'm the second generation. I'm a pure American kid. But my father, he was raised during the Dep Great Depression. Therefore, he felt I should be raised during the Great Depression as well. <laughs> so, uh, my father was tough. He paddled me. and he, We all had this speech. My father looked at me when I was like 10 years old, and he just goes, I am your father. I am not your friend. I will never be your friend. When I tell you to get out of bed, you get out now. You put your work clothes on. I don't care what time it is. I don't want to hear anything out of your mouth. Right. When I say jump, you say how high. And, and you way, say, am I jumping the way you want me to be jumping? <laughs> exactly. He had me laying concrete and painting our three story wide stone brownstone in Pennsylvania when I was 10 years old. He, mm -hmm. he, you know, he's like, he's up on a ladder and he's, he wants me to hold the bottom of the ladder. And it's like, I'm 10. What am I going to do to stop this? You know, <laughs> right. So yeah. I think at one point he said, you know, maybe when you're 35, I might find you interesting enough to have a beer with you. And then, wow. then maybe we can be friends, you know, and that's my dad. I am, um, you know, my mom was the classic homemaker, dinner on the table. My dad was a doctor. Um, he taught medical school. So we had a very traditional life. You know, I remember him saying, you, you know, you can do anything as long as it agrees with what I think you should be doing. Or, right. you know, we had the very, you know, dinner at the same time every day, chores. This is how you, there was a chores. right way and there was a wrong way to do things. And the right way usually was his way. And so the wrong way was anything he didn't agree with. And so that was very, we were very rule-based, very earning-based. I mean, he was a good man and a very loving uh, father. And at the same time, he had really high standards. So it was kind of confusing. And I think at one level, there was this, you know, I remember saying to my daughter when she turned 15, she was mad at me for something. I said, start a list of all the things you'll never do to your kid. And then you'll scratch them out one by one. And she said, how do you know that? I said, because I did. You know, I'll never do that to my kid. I'll never do that to my kid. Did it, did it, did it. So, yeah, we definitely have places where I think this is such a different generation. I know, Brad, we talked about the day that my daughter, Kate, was in sixth grade, and I went to school. Maybe it was fourth grade. You know, you get older, your memory kind of fades. Yeah, it does. And there was a huge <laughs> sign in the assembly room that said, question authority. And I remember thinking, What? You don't question authority, you listen to authority, you earn authority. And here my kids are being taught to question authority. And so in a very strange way, it was the beginning of my going, huh, something, huh, something different is happening here. Because here are teachers telling kids to question authority. And in my house, you know, I, I have to admit, I did have a little bit of my dad in me. And it was kind of my way or the highway until I got to be a little bit older. Um, that, that reality of, and to, you know, there's a respect issue and then there's the, freedom issue that our kids have that's so different from us. I feel like we were yeah. raised on respect and rules. Yes. And, oh, yeah. you know, well, so it's very different. Well, I, I, you know, my household, it, it was that way as well. It was the, it was the highway, the, uh, you know, it's my dad's way or the highway. My way or the highway. Yeah. When I was 18, he came into my bedroom uh, the morning of my birthday and he said, oh, you're some kind of man now. Uh, you, you need to, uh, you have three choices in this household. You can get a job and start paying us some, you know, money for room and board and food. And he goes, and the second thing is, is you can go to college and try and help you pay for it. And I'm like, what's the third choice? He goes, you can pay back up and move out bucko and go hang out with your pot smoking friends and i'm like 
but but and he goes, my house, my rules. And then wow. he leaves it. And then he's like, uh, don't tell your mother we had this conversation, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> this was like. We definitely know. grew up with my house, my rules. And if you are watching our blab, um, you know, Papa, uh, hands up if you were raised my house, my rules, uh, because that really is how we, <laughs> there they come. We were raised that way, and yet we did not raise our kids that way. And I think the reality, you and I have talked at length about this, Brad, the millennial generation is the first group of kids who are raised in a totally different mindset. Yes. They are not modern world kids like we are. They are right. postmodern kids, and it is a different world. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, when was the first time? I'm going to answer this real quick, but I remember the first time I realized there's a huge generational problem, and that was when I started my internet company, K2, and those first wave of uh, digital natives is what I have to call them. They came in, and we didn't know anything. We were just like, okay, this next generation, I'm going to hire them, and anybody who was three years to ten years younger than me, they were weird. They were telling me off from my own company. I signed their paycheck, and they were giving me the middle finger. They were working crazy hours. They were working on laptops, and I, I thought at first I fired maybe one or two people. And um, you're making noise. Sorry, I'm moving my mic a little better. Sorry. There you go. But um, I remember looking at these young people, and, and they weren't that much younger than me, but they were acting completely different. And after I fired one or two people, I started to realize, you know what, maybe I'm the one who's wrong. And I started to realize they were working completely differently. And I started mm -hmm. doing the research from that point on, and I realized – Anybody born after 1977, after 1977, wow. thinks completely differently than our generation. They were raised completely differently. And that's why we're putting this, this uh, blab together. We're going to explain those in three separate uh, blabs, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun. But when did you first notice that there was a, a real generational difference? Well, as I said, that moment that I walked into – the elementary school and there was you know the signs the bumper stickers the assembly on questioning authority that was a, a, a big aha and a big wake-up call for me i think the other big reality check was as my kids got to you know high school and then their tw teen years they didn't have the same drive that same i've got to figure out you know or follow the rules and part of that was our parenting, right. and part of that was giving them a voice. But part of it was the world they lived in where everybody was asking them, what do you want to do? So right. our kids felt like they were equals. I mean, I, I have said my house, my rules. I have said, what do you think, which is kind of those two opposite sides of the coin. So it really began to hit me early on. And then I went to when I went to grad school and started studying postmodernism and realizing the lack of absolute truth that our kid, my kids were being raised with, I had to either – get on board and wake up to what was happening or I was going to be fighting with them forever. And our kids are, you know, they're, they're not doing what we thought they should be doing right. at this point, but I'm really proud of them. And at some point I was talking with a baby boom. I mean, a, I was talking with a millennial gal yesterday and I said, you know, I think at some level there is the judgment that our parents have that, yes. that we have. And then there's the jealousy of the freedom they have. Are you getting back noise? Yeah, just a little bit. No, not from you. I'm I'm at Starbucks. <laughs> it's really noisy there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Go ahead. That's Keep okay. going. So we, she and I were talking. She is in. She is a millennial, and her family, extended family, is kind of struggling with some things that they're doing with their kids and all that kind of stuff. And my comment to her was, I think parents are both not. I mean, I hate to use the word judgmental. But they're criticizing what's happening. They're kind of critiquing what's happening with their millennial kids. And there is a level of, I think, jealousy because there's a freedom and a level of choice that our millennial kids have that I don't feel like we ever had. We did what we were supposed to do. We did what our parents did. Right. And and part of that is uh, I see boomers all the time who look at millennials and go, why are these kids acting the way they are? And not realizing, well, you raised them to be exactly the way they are on a subconscious <laughs> level. And that really yeah. bothers them. And and we're, we're going to answer a few questions soon, but I, I'm going to tell you how needed this is, what we're doing. I was sitting here at Barnes & Noble the other day in this cafe, and three older women came in who were obviously boomers, and they were complaining, not complaining, but they couldn't understand why their 31-year-old son, uh, one of them, he was at UPS for almost two years, and he quit. 
he said, uh, these people are evil. <laughs> and they're like, what is going on? I said, well, you raise them. So that we have 30 year olds living at home because we changed the criteria for them. So if you want them out of the house, you should have started when they were two years old. It's over. They're going right. to stay there and do what they're going to do. Um, well, I would say yes and no. Um, we'll get into that when we talk about parenting. Absolutely. But did you see? Did you see the um, cover of Time? The, yes, Octo I should, the cover of Time. You know, is, this October issue is all about millennials, and I think wherever I go with the couples I work with, there is that level of. I don't understand what they're doing. Why there was almost this? There should be a switch that turned. Well, they got to college and now they're supposed to be like us. Why aren't they like us? And it's been a real interesting, you know, journey. So I'm excited that we get to talk about it. Sure. And uh, I brought my props along. So we're going to start okay. fielding questions. But I want everybody to realize we went from this. Right. <laughs> this is how we we train kids, and we moved over to this. This bad boy right here. I remember those. <laughs> Die. So uh, our brains, our brains are actually different, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> They're more complex, and we're going to delve into that over the next couple of these. So let's uh, let's open up to some Q and A. Uh, do we want to put Brandon in first since he was first? Let's see if I can add Brandon. You want to be added to the conversation, Brandon? <laughs> Now, bear with me. We've had enough technical stuff this morning. <laughs> okay, Brandon's up top. Let me see if I can do this. This is also, and um, I'm gonna add. I'm gonna add you, Brandon. How's that? And here he comes. Boom! You should be coming in now. Brandon is a coach and um, good friend. He's coached me on a couple of things on how to get this podcast together. <laughs> and let me try this. There, I clicked on it. This is a blab, Brad, not a podcast. <laughs> well, it is kind of. It's a podcast. Well, it's interesting. You know, I actually was talking with a video gal the other day and apparently podcasts are really produced. I was in my mastermind group and I was like, what's the big deal? I don't understand what's, you know, what all the different things are. And I love the interaction of this where we can talk and ask questions. Okay. I have both of those says JC. You still have your viewfinder? Click, click, click. Have you made your kids use them? <laughs> JC, yeah, yeah. We view, view master. We were raised on view masters. You have yeah. to approve me, Brad. Did you approve? Yeah. I keep clicking on it. I keep approving you. I don't know why it's not. Let's see low. if I can approve him. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not a ho uh, I'm not. I'm a, not a host, so I can't. You have to do it. Yeah, okay. My daughter has Dora the Explorer one. Do you know what's interesting? Is it is it JC or J J? It's J. You know what's interesting to me? Oh, Jason. You know what's interesting to me, Jason, is that so much of what we kind of threw away so our kids could be mod you know, in all of the newest technology is coming back. You know, the old fashioned dolls, the viewfinders, the door of the explorer. Yep. It just, it's pretty fun to see. I know we're moving back towards, you know, wooden blocks, just something as silly as that, which you couldn't find for a while when my kids were growing up. I've approved you as a host. Now let's see if I can get you in there. And Jay, thank you so much also for being on. We're going to get you in uh, Jason, the hot seat. It says, okay, um, he says that you have to unlock the seat. How do I do that? Oh, uh, I see. Open seat. In, born in 20, I'm 27, born in 8. Would I be a millennial? Uh, yes, you would, Jason. Yes, you would. <laughs> you know, I, oh, I have to show this. This is so funny. I got this hysterical. He would be, what's the year for millennials according to you, Brad? You're the expert. I have a fuzzy year definition. Well, for me, anybody born after 1977 is called a digital native. But millennials, mm -hmm. they've they've lumped um, generation, um, they've lumped they've lumped uh, generation Y and millennials as kind of one. So uh, I really see it this way: anybody born after 1984 to like 1993 and around there right. is a true millennial, and that's really from about 21 years of age on up to 35. 
Uh, anybody younger than it is really Generation Z. And by the way, I don't want you to think this is a box to put people into because I've met millennials who act like boomers. I've met boomers who act like millennials. And I've met Generation X who, um, you know, they act like both sides. So it, it's right. interesting. Okay. You know, me... see if you can, Brad, if you make me a host, I can fix this for you. I did. Jason I keep, says, I keep clicking no, on it. did you make Jason a host? If you make Jason a host, I can fix this for you. Jason, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get so you. So here's in. what's really funny. You know why Jason can fix it? Because he's a digital native. <laughs> he was raised with this. You know, I was talking to a, a I just friend made the other day. Host. Okay. Ha, 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 Jason says. So here's what's funny. There was this little kid and in the shopping cart at the store, and the mom was standing in the checkout line, thumbing through a magazine, and the little boy was on her phone, on her little iPhone, pushing buttons. I don't think he knows what a magazine is. No. <laughs> I've had, um, I've done hundreds of keynote speeches, and I got to tell you, I've had so many parents who are older, C-level executives, they come up to me after my talk, and they look at me, and they have tears in their eyes, and one woman said to me, she goes, I now understand why my four-year-old granddaughter wants an iPhone instead of a Barbie, <laughs> and so right. it's, it's a whole new world. It really is. Okay, Brandon Krieger, did you want to call back in, Jason says. So if Jason's a host, I'm not a host. Um, Technology's fabulous, and it's awful. So thank you, everybody who's on, who's really seems, trying to be. It seems to be out of sync. That's what it seems to be. What do you mean? It seems to be a little bit out of sync. That's what it is. Because I click on everybody to come in as a, as a host, and it's, it doesn't seem to be doing it. Okay. So maybe I have to unlock uh, the seat is locked or it's unlocked. I don't know. You have to you have to unlock the seats. If you lock the seats, nobody can come in. So you have to unlock the seats. I'm trying. <laughs> okay, calling back in now. Great. Thanks, Brandon. So hard hearing him because of the clutter. Yes. You got some Sorry. real bad back noise. So really? yeah. Protect Sorry your microphone. Yeah. Yes. Chef. Carrick, is that correct? So, Chef, tell us your like ages. We're trying to figure out where people are. Sorry, Sarix, Chef Sarix. Okay, that's fabulous. The Sarah, seats are yes. unlocked, Brad. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So now we should be able to bring people in and out. I'm yes. still a guest, so I can't. But you can. Whoops. Chef. Sarek is 45. So do you have millennial kids, Sarek? Let me make you a host again, JC. I made JC a host. And then now we got to find Brandon. So here's a question, Jason. If I open the seat... That's a tough one. Yes, I do, but more of a baby daddy, not one of by the district. Okay. One of those young and stupid decisions. Well, we've all made them. We've all made well, them. That's why. <laughs> on the cover of Time magazine uh, recently, they had uh, millennials on the phone pushing a stroller, and it says, help me. My parents are millennials. So this is like a huge issue. I think you guys are going to make great parents. I think they're panicking, but, you know, that's why we are kind of putting this together. Where'd you go, Susie? All right, I lost my co-host. Where'd she go? Anyways, so Susie's going to call back in or something. I don't know how she lost her seat. So, all right. Brandon, let's see if we can get you in. Da -da. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. This is our first blab, and I'm sure it shows. Should be an easier way to add uh, people to um, a seat. Uh, I don't know why that's uh, happening. Susie dropped out. I don't know how nope, that happened. I'm back. I'm back. He got me in. There she is. She's back in. Okay. I think. I think. Um, okay. You there? NH for real. I'm here. NH for real says. Can you not hear me? Oh, they said it's not you. Blab is having issues. Okay. Thank you. I can hear you. I've, Thanks, I Jason. Like I do these all the time, and I'm sitting here going, what is going on to this morning? 
Yeah, uh, I have been on a number of labs and never had this kind of trouble. So hold on. Sarah, can, you can hear us, but you can't see me. Brandon, I could be. Oh, so you're back on. You disappeared, Susie, for a little bit. I did. I did. I got I got cut out. So here I am. So <laughs> <laughs> this could be a lesson in how boomers deal with technology, right? Yes. What would our dad say? Get it right. Practice. Do it better next time. <laughs> no, no, no. My dad would have gone, what are you, a moron? You're an idiot. You don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, so anyways, uh, let's field a few questions that have already been here. Uh, some people have asked, like Brandon asked, how do you, how do you teach a, a young person today how to get a job in this day and age? What do you think, Susie? How do you teach them to get a job or how do you motivate them to get a job, to want to get a job? I find that millennials are on a journey of exploration and self-actualization versus the money, the job, the security that we all that we pursued, that we wanted when we were their age. And I think that's the big difference. You know, one of the millennials I was talking with, my son actually had a bunch of friends and we were talking over the holidays. And he said, you know, so many of our needs were met growing up that we don't struggle for the basic things. We don't struggle to see if we need to, yeah. you know, food, gas, whatever. Our parents gave us everything. And so we want to have meaning. We want to, we want to chase that. And as a parent, we gave them permission to have that mindset. So really, I believe it's not just educating them to get a job, it's, it's understanding the motivation and finding a place where those can intersect. Yeah. What about you, Brad? Well, there's, th there's three things we're gonna delve into over the next couple of weeks, and that is, uh, first they were taught that science fiction is science fact. Uh, the second wow. thing is mm -hmm. video, video games came into the household, and um, that changed the brain and how they actually work. It's more iterative and jumping from one thing to the next and multitasking. Also, um, every single movie or thing that they, they looked at as kids was um, always about a kid using technology to battle you know, adults. The adults are evil, and they have to be you know, taken out with technology or magic. It's Harry Potter, and the third thing was child-centric parenting and teaching, and that. We are going to talk about that. Yeah, that that flattened all the hierarchy, not only in the household, but it also flattened the hierarchy um, in the school system. And then in business, they walked in and they told the CEO, "Hey, I can run this plus better," because they don't see authority figures as someone to fear; they see them as a peer. So all this has changed the mindset. What's going on in this gray matter for the next generation? So. The thing I recommend, there are less and less jobs because we're moving into the 21st century. So a lot of 20th century jobs have either moved overseas or those jobs are just going away because they're from the, they're from the industrial age, not the digital age. Right. Um, so you are looking at a shrinking job market. And what I usually tell millennials is make your own job. You know, you, you can start a company now at this age and things like that. That doesn't mean they're going to be successful at it, but it does mean they'll be able to do something with it. Ah, we got people coming in. But um, Accept him. You got to accept him, Brad. Okay. I'm I not accept, a host, so I can't accept. I accept you into my life, JC. Uh, <laughs> I think it's says, Jason, he said. Jace. I accepted him. I clicked on it. I did too. He's a host, so he should be. By teaching them this, you are teaching them about jobs and future planning. Yes, I would agree, uh, Sarek, but here's the thing I think is really interesting is how many parents out there when they're I, millennial I, kid. I clicked Go ahead. on it. I keep okay. clicking on it. I so how many? It. Go ahead. My question is how many parents out there when their millennial kid says, hey, I'm starting a business, like you just mentioned, Brad, go, yay, let me support you. More of it's like get a real job. So part of what has to happen is educating parents and boomers about millennials, educating millennials about the way boomers think, oh, sorry, that was my mic, how boomers think, and kind of going, you know, almost like a translation between the two of them. Because to me, the reality is they need to understand where we're coming from as much as we need to understand where they're coming from so we can have a far more productive conversation. Yeah, yeah. Somebody likes that. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, Chef Sarek he, uh, said something. He was like, get him to do chores and cut the grass and do the lawn. A lot mm -hmm. of people did not raise their kids that way. A lot of them were afraid of that. And that was that was our our um, 
our generation actually, Susie, was uh, raised uh, that way. You had to do chores. You had to earn everything. You had to do all these things. And um, uh, now we took that away. Not everybody, but a lot of people took that away when they raised millennials. They became friends with their kids. They negotiated. They drove right. them everywhere. When I wanted to be in drumline, my father said, good luck with that. You're going to be walking. So I carried a drum <laughs> through some pretty bad neighborhoods just to be in drumline. So right. that has been taken away, and we have to reinstill that into society. I don't know why uh, JC's not coming in. Can you approve him? I can't approve him. It's not letting me approve. Oh, maybe he's here now. JC, I can. You're in, I think. I see something circling. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we're going to talk about all these influences over the next couple of weeks. Influences like yeah. this. Ender's Game. Ender's Game. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's so, interesting uh, to me is Star Wars is coming out again. And, you know, I remember in ninth grade sitting in the theater with my boyfriend watching the very first Star Wars. I remember the month before I was married, sitting in line at the theater to get into the third, the Return of the Jedi, the last one. And right. so, we, you know, we were, you know, Star Wars opened the door for possibility. And then now that our kids watched it, and now there's a whole other, you know, generation who's doing it. And there's more and more of the future stuff that we thought was, you know, fantasy that's real. I know I just saw a, um, a post last week on Facebook about, there you go. There you go. The Force Awakens, a whole other generation. A, p a post about, you know, Marty McFly. How many of you watched Back to the Future? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And, you know, the very first time Marty's, you know, time machine was set to, I think it was October 15th, 2015. Well, you know, we don't have hover skateboard yet. We're close. And so the stuff that was the the future, the Jetsons, the possibility, our kids are actually not just living with, but creating. And that yes. changes everything. JC, you were there. We do have hoverboards. He says uh, audio only. So go ahead, Jace. Says you have a poor internet signal. Click to give props. Okay, I click to give props. It's your can connection. You we can see Brad and Susie. So Jason, uh, NH for real is saying that it's your connection because Brad and I are visible to them. And Chef Sarek, I'd love to know hoverboard. They're already out there. Yes, they are. Uh, I, I, want every, yep, I want everybody to know that 90% of the devices that you saw in Star Wars and even Star Trek um, are now happening. They actually have them. They actually beamed uh, two years ago. They actually did the Star Trek thing of beaming um, one molecule to the other side of the room. So uh, to boomers, it was Star Trek. And to uh, the traditionalists, it was Buck Rogers in the 23rd century. Uh, but to millennials, Star Wars came first. And Star Wars, according to Dr. Michio Keiko, the noted theoretical physicist, Star Wars initiated a paradigm shift. That's his quotes. And um, that changed everything. That changed how movies were made. That changed how we saw stories. That changed how we saw children. Uh, and it also changed how women were perceived in the media as well and on TV and right. things like that. So it's been it's been a, sh a huge shift. So for this generation, Star Trek came later and Star Trek to them is kind of a boomer kind of thing. It's not a, uh, you know, a um, it's not their brand, let's say. Uh, Transformers is a pure uh, millennial brand. Definitely boomer. Yeah, I really I remember buying them. I remember thinking, you know, number one, who came up with these and and our, our son loving them and the reality of, and just think about being raised on Transformers, being able to shape shift, being able to change, being able to be, you know, the options that were available. You could be a robot and then a car. And so our kids, millennials don't do limitations well, which at one level is fabulous because it means things are being invented. You know, I think back to when President Kennedy, I wasn't alive or maybe I was just born, but I've studied his speech. We're going to put him in on the moon in 10 years and we're going to do it through materials and metals and processes that aren't even invented yet. And oh, yeah. that just, you know, that inspired a generation to really do things. I think the millennials are creating things so fast and so fabulous that, you know, keeping up is, you know, tough. And at the same time, there is this idea of open-ended that we didn't grow up with. It was a very methodical, oh, yeah. you know, rules. Here's how you're supposed to do things versus, you know, millennials don't have those parameters and it's great at so many levels. And yet at a, at a few levels, which I know we're going to discuss during our blabs and during our kind of video series, 
that really frustrate boomer parents and educating boomers on that would really help. And what do you think of that, Brad? Well, uh, I work with Rob Hirschfeld, who used to be at Dell. He's now a CEO at Rack N. And um, there was a Voltron. He, 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 yeah, Voltron. He used to be. Uh, um, in charge of the the cloud division and he and I got together and we started blogging and 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 writing white papers for Dell and really what it boiled mm -hmm. down to is the boomers who invented these this technology weren't working in the technology so it didn't affect them and the next generation wanted to work more like it was jazz you know like hey we're we're here to have fun we're here to be creative and they would produce a lot of work but the boomers and the gen xers were still sitting there treating it like it was factory work like why aren't you done with that software yet well, software, right. it's like art. You have to make sure it isn't going to, you know, we have alpha and beta testing and we have all these other things and they have to write the code and they have to customize the code and they have mm -hmm. to, you know, take into consideration everything that's going to go wrong. So Rob and I came up with this metaphor where uh, boomers and Gen X even are raised like in a symphony orchestra. You are trained in musicianship. You might be able to, you know, play three or four instruments, but a conductor controls every single right. performance and no one's right. allowed to do any improv unless they're chosen you get five minutes for improv and now you get to sit down and guess what you fought long and hard to get the first chair in the front so that means you had to be i was first chair flute Woohoo! and that's what you wanted if you were second chair flute or third chair flute your parents said to you why aren't you first chair work harder do this practice more right. i want to pause for a second here because NH for real just said thanks for acknowledging us Gen X um, and he, she said that to you Brad so let's yeah. talk about you know you talked about the digital native mm -hmm. there's you know boomers cuspers you know it's weird to think that my mom is in the same uh, you know generation as I am because we're so different because boomers span so long right talk about Gen X and Gen Y and then you mentioned Gen Z and then the whole millennial and we don't want to put people in in you know boxes but we want right. to understand per, you know paradigms can you do that for us Brad Absolutely. Let's start with the baby boomer. Baby boomers were born right after World War II, 1946 to about 1964. We, and you and I are boomers, we were raised on a linear way of learning. So we had to sit down, shut up, and obey the rules. We had to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we could not talk back to the teacher. The teacher was an authority figure to fear. And we were petrified. I got in so much trouble for that. Right. If you screwed up, your career was over. And we took that paradigm in our brains and we moved out into the world and we went to college and we obeyed the rules and hierarchy, a lot of hierarchy. If you're 20, you hierarchy. know nothing. If you're 30, oh, maybe you know a little bit. 40, you should be managing. 50 and 60, you should have the corner office and life is going to be good and young people are going to look up to you and admire you because that's the way it was for right. generations. You before. really, you earn, you earn your respect based right. on your experience and your age. Exactly. And boomers were taught um, that age plus experience plus learning and skill set will get you uh, the corner office. OK. And th that took okay. a lot of time. Now, Gen X came along right at, right around 1965 into 77. And what happened with them is they were the first latchkey kids. You see, boomers were the, the boomers were the first to be indoctrinated into the public school system. We've been called the radical generation, but that's not true. We're the generation that conformed the most to the, to the world because of that. Now, Gen X came along and divorce was happening. Life wasn't so great. We had uh, we had ended Vietnam and, you know, everybody was disco dancing, but it wasn't a great time because now people were moving into developments. Um, cynicism started to come up because uh, now Gen, Gen X Gen X was coming home and mom and dad weren't home. Mom and dad were working. Both parents had to start working. So Gen X grew up with. I'm going to interrupt mouth. you for one second. Sure. In actually finish your Gen X before you go to Gen Y. I wanted to say what Jason said. So go ahead. Sure. Gen X was the first. Sorry about that. And I'm going to approve Ramon in just a minute. Gen X um, became a little cynical and their bands reflected that. It was part of the grunge movement with Pearl Jam and Nirvana and the Red right. Hot Chili Peppers. So you have a generation that has all the boomer skills, but they also. We got are, Brandon. Oh, my God. We got Brandon. I'm totally interrupting you because he might leave. We got Brandon. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Finally. Whoever made that happen, thank you. So, Brad, I'm totally, totally interrupting you. Yes, hip hop and rap, and, and we want to go back to Jason's comment. And speaking, by the way, speaking of Brandon, Brandon is Gen X. Am I correct? Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's hard. Like it, it's hard because I don't think of myself as a boomer. 
Um, my mom's a boomer. That's that post-depression yes. age. So She's you're old. a Gen X. When were you born, Brandon? Uh, 1975. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So you're totally, you're totally that Gen Xer. So would you, would you? Were you uh, angry as a kid? Yeah. Oh, no. well, for sure. I mean, as as you know, like you're hearing, it, you're kind of fighting against the system, right? You don't know where to go, what to do. The direction is, you know, like Brad was saying, is you get a job, you get education, you get a job. We were feeling that, mm -hmm. that mindset is, no, I don't want to get a job. I, I don't think it doesn't feel right. This education right. model, this, you know, repetitive learning, you know, say cat, yep. say cat, say cat, yeah. spell, C-A-T, yeah. like that. Cut at, cut at, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and then, I think your generation was when parents began to listen a little right. bit more because we didn't we didn't want to do the same things, you know, you know, I would say this, our generation, Brad, started the list of, I don't want to be like my parents. I don't think our parents did that. Yeah, and so, customers. you know, customers. yeah. So there, you know, for you, the, you know, Brandon, that idea of, I don't, this doesn't feel right. I don't want to do this. And there was some level of, I think, as you got older, affirmation of those kind of thoughts at home, it became yes. more and more of a sense of, okay. Oh, not for Brandon. Okay. So oh, no. talk about that. I got, I got like reamed into, like I did all the wrong things. Right? Nice. I had the under, entrepreneur mm -hmm. mindset, right? That yeah. no, I was a C type student, right? I didn't rather, fall into the high school model and the education. And, and I was I was ridiculed for it from the education system as well as from my, my parents. Cause like you're doing, you're failing. You're failing in life. You're right. a rebel. You're a rebel, Brandon. I am. <laughs> you know, Susie, I remember what? being in trouble because I would talk. I didn't fit the mold. I asked questions. I didn't fit the mold. And right. here, oh. Chef Sarek says, I don't think you should base it off of the time, but rather the presidential monarchy era because the mindsets changed from Nixon, Ford, Kennedy, Carter, Reagan. Absolutely. Society made huge strides yeah. and technology leaped based on our need for it. Right. I would agree with the, that and, and Brad way on this with she, with. Boomers sure. up until the millennials. I think the postmodern era changed our kids. And it's a really yeah. different generation than X and Y. Yeah, see what I'm, I was saying gonna... my, my, my experience was that when I was doing, when I was going through, like I tried to follow that system of getting an education, you know, struggling through that process, getting a job. And I worked for the Ontario government. So I worked for, you know, the career, right? And eventually, I, I like after a couple of years, I, I quit because I just couldn't sit into that mold. Right. And I mean, now I'm an entrepreneur. I own my own business. I own my own marketing company. I get to be creative and, and be, you know, the way my, my mind works. I work with technology. I'm constantly innovative. But that's right. understanding kind of where I'm going. And now going back to talk to my parents, talk to my grandparents about what happened. Well, you know, we really don't feel comfortable you be doing, but, you know, if it's working for you, keep doing it. Right. Well, let, let me let me uh, jump in here, and I'll, I'll I'll continue. I agree with the geopolitical influences because yeah, that is true. But I also look at technology and parenting, and uh, a right. lot of our movies and and uh, media were huge influences on the psyche. And I want you to look back at 1977. What started to happen? We before 1977, movies were about heroes. Okay, it was John Wayne and things like that. But after 1977, with with films uh, by John Hughes, uh, and don't take this the wrong way, it's not a judgment call, but the loser, the outcast, the outlier was now the hero in these movies. And so uh, everything from 16 Candles to the, the Breakfast Club and things like this showed the person who maybe wasn't mainstream becoming the hero. And I think that that formed something in the minds of Gen X and millennials. I hear a lot of noise. I think that really idea, I think we've got a couple really big things going on. You're right, I was typing. I should have just actually taught that. Um, sorry, I should have muted dumb boomer that I am or cusper or whatever the heck it is. Um, Steve, service address. If you want to join or Steve up here, Yeti, Steve the Yeti, just click on to join. We'd love to chat with you. Here's yes. the thing. We ended then with an angry pushback kit generation. I think, you know, and Gen X got caught in that because they had parents like yes. us still saying, here's what yes. you do, here's what you shouldn't do. So there is that angry grunge, that kind of thing. I think what you're trying to say is changing the mindset of people into socialism. What? <laughs> so I think the reality is millennials, in my mind, and I, Brad can disagree with this. For me, the term millennial really encompasses the first generation of kids 
who are now adults who were raised with a postmodern mindset. And we're going to dive into that in another blab a little bit more. But that whole idea of nothing, it, there's no absolute truth. You kind of bend systems and um, society to your will. You know, Clinton, somebody mentioned the Clinton era. I also think that possibility thinking made a difference versus the modern mindset of there's a right, there's a wrong, there's black, there's white, there's a hierarchy. Yeah, that's yeah. and there's, the, and there's that's one the way huge to do aha I see. Right. There's one way to do something. And by the way, I just want to jump in. Chef Sterick is actually correct. This idea of a, a sort of a kiddie socialism started in the public school system. And we're going to talk about yeah. that on another blab. But that that is that's true. Let's call it what it is. We had the Western mindset for so long, which said um, effort in gets effort out. And there was one way to do everything. But now right. we have a new way. And there's like 100 ways to get a problem done and that's because we've unhinged you you have a young person that was raised for 18 years whether it was 12 years in the public school system or another six years in college um to just be collaborative and there's no right or wrong and we're all in this together you and i are right. all equal sound familiar okay so yeah he's yeah. kind of right Trump I mean, he's <laughs> you know that whole he is right and 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 i'm a parent who helped that i remember you know, a trophy for showing up. Our kids, you know, I walked to school. We played after school in the yard. There weren't all these organized sports, and we'll talk about that in another one as well because we're winding down on time here. But that idea well, of we, we, every... we can go to 1130 because we uh, we started late. So we can go to okay. 1115, 1120. Yep. Okay. Okay, that's great. I think, oh, we got Charlie joining us. Charlie Yay. does the Boomer, a great podcast. I love his podcast. Charlie. But I really believe that that some of the confusion that is happening with millennials now is the fact that boomer parents raise them to be independent, have a thought, what does Johnny think kind of ran the house? And I know we're going to talk about child centric parenting, but now we're saying, wait, shift and do it our way. And that's a huge contradiction and a real sense of conflict for millennials. And I think the time magazine article is a huge representation of that. Millennials are like, well, I don't want to be like them, but I'm not sure what my role models are. And I know for me as with clients, I see a lot of younger people now who are like, I want a parent, but not like my parents. Exactly. That's uh, what it is. They were brainwashed. Well, I, th I think we, we wanted to be friends with our parents secretly, the cusp boomer. And uh, we watched our parents die and we didn't become friends till later in age. And I think um, we lost our minds because we were all working. And I think women felt guilty and men wanted to spend more time with their kids. So they kind of compensated. And they compensated by saying yes to everything and driving them everywhere and giving them karate lessons and dance lessons and all this right. other stuff. So, uh, And I know we're also going to unpack. Everything. It did. And I know we're also going to unpack the reality that Freud didn't come until the 50s. And so by the 70s and 80s, the whole underscore of psychology talking about our feelings came up. And so, you know, Brad, you and I were raised in the, well, how do you, you know, we went to therapy and found out that we were shamed growing up or that we were yes. thwarted or that we were told we were stupid. And that was not even a concept with our parents because there was no real awareness of the subconscious. Right. So then we went into parenting and thought, hey, I don't want Johnny or Sally to feel less or feel bad about themselves. So let's make them feel you know, positive. Well, and we kind of created our own monsters. Well, th this started with Carl Rogers in the in the 60s. He was a PhD who wrote a, uh, a yes. series of papers. Oh, yeah. horse. And he talked, to, he basically said that the reason society's all screwed up is nobody has self-esteem. And he says, you know, um, this is why people don't choose the right jobs. This is why they become poor. This is why they choose crime. This is all these things. So this huge movement started on the West Coast to basically give kids self-esteem. That's all we're going to do. Right. Everybody's got to. So the school system changed and parenting changed. And my father was a chiropractor. He had a Ph.D. in chiropractic medicine. And when he heard about this stuff, he gave it his stamp of approval. Susie, he said, this is a load of crap. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I remember um, my dad saying something, too. <laughs> so Why are you getting counseling? Just suck it up. <laughs> It's true. That's something Jim Palmer would say. Suck it up. <laughs> yeah, but it's um, we now have entered a complex world where, where criminals now have high self-esteem. Um, and, and yes, we, it is hard to teach your kids how to make better choices, you know, whether, you know, uh, who's, who's, a, who's a safe adult. And I, I look at it this way. You really can't let your kids 
uh, alone anymore. You just can't. <laughs> uh, so I have a question for Brandon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brandon, I know while you try to let him in, uh, Brad, you're cutting in and out, Brad. I'm going to ask Brandon, tell us a little bit about like your growing up or are you, do you have kids now? Are you in that phase of trying to figure out what to do? Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, no, I have a son. He's in the States. He lives with his mom. Uh, what I find is because I have, like Brad knows, I, I work with clients that have all different uh, mindsets when it comes to education and knowledge and their kids and social media because I run a marketing company. So when they, even yesterday, I met with a, a parent and they're asking about social media marketing. Like, what do they do? And the value they, that they get from social media and their self esteem in the sense of, looking at likes, comments, and shares if they post something and taking selfies and doing all that gives them their value of who they are as a person, as an individual. And then them trying to think of career. Like, what do they do for a career now? They're so inundated with the options now. It's not clear cut that what they do. So they get kind of lost of, hey, you know, I want to do this education, this career. I want to go this career path. But then it's right. like, okay, but hold on. You know, do I do... YouTube videos and, and, and do cosmetic or do, do that and then have advertisers and sponsors and make money that way and have this bit like it's just the sky's the limit but it, and now it's too much like they yeah. don't they don't okay so at some level I hear what you say what you're saying is and again somebody else mentioned that a couple of things we do we don't give people self esteem you're right we develop but I think that was Sarah, Chef Sarek but Brandon I think what you're saying that could really be helpful for us to address is this idea of kind of that both and, you know, the sky's the limit and you're overwhelmed because you're drinking from a fire hydrant. So, you know, some of what kept us safe was the rules. I know Brad and I talk about, you know, kids need to know structure. They need to have some of that. So finding a, ha a happy medium, is that a bit of what you're, what you're referring to? Well, I'm trying to get you in, Stephen, too. No, just not happy medium, but just an understanding of what is out there for parents to kind of give guidance because, and to give real true guidance versus like there's a documentary on Netflix where it talks about what parents tell their kids after they're done their homework, make sure you do your YouTube video. Right. Right. Make sure you That's do your funny. YouTube video for, and make sure you get enough likes because you have to get likes because you want to make sure you get that sponsorship. If you don't get that sponsorship, you know, it's you're not going to get that, that revenue coming in. So that is so scary for me to hear as a psychologist. It's so scary. That is such a slippery slope. This is my opinion. Feel free to disagree of where people find their value because then it's all about, you know, if I'm not liked by the world, do I, you know, then you either become a sensationalist. Right. It's terrible. I feel that it scares me. Well, and that's what they're that. showing in the video. That's what they're showing in the video is that the problem was is that these kids were going in and they weren't getting enough likes. So now they felt depressed. Right. right. Oh my God, I'm not good enough. I'm, I don't feel the self-esteem. Oh, you know what? You know, Let's buy him a trophy. Right. What, yeah. do I, <laughs> what do I do now, mom? I'm not getting more likes. We'll get out and do more right. videos. Well, let's take them out for yeah. fourth meal at Taco Bell. Um, someone just <laughs> asked if it's the same in Canada. And yes, pretty much the influences all over the world are a little bit different. And, and we'll talk about that later uh, in our next uh, blab. But um, yeah, it, I'm looking down here. The millennial issue is, is pretty much the same all over the world. And it's not an issue. You know, it's just a whole different way of thinking. I don't want anybody to judge this. I just want you to observe and learn, and you'll never see the world the same after uh, these these series of blabs that we do. I'm well, trying to get everybody really, in, by the way. The thing about you guys doing this is you're bringing attention and, and the understanding that, hey, there's so much going on right now that parents need help with. And that's what they right. talked about. It takes a try to, to, to raise a child, right? We're losing yeah. that because what happens is we used to have the communal, especially when I'm like talking about in Toronto. Right. Neighbors are so divided. Right. Talking yeah. to them, it's kind of like, hey, John, it's like, hey, I got to go. You know, I got to go to work, drop the kids off, do all that. But you don't have that communal experience. So they're getting all that. And community is community. coming online, right? That's what I was just going to say. The community now is yeah, on, sorry. online. And the the if you're not there, now they feel that loss that, oh, my God, you know what? I can't connect with my friend. I connect with my family because they're online. But they're not really not your true family or friends. And they don't have that value in you. So they're, they come and go. And our young generation, which you guys are talking about, they're losing their value because their value right. is online. Well, if I don't get that recognition because yes. I post an image and I don't get enough likes or comments, well, no one likes me. I'm not loved. Right. Right. And that, to me, is very unsettling. And it's why people are chasing sensationalism. Um, mm -hmm. Chuck Bartok said, I don't have a generation. I feel so depressed. So I'm saying we can, <laughs> Brad can find you one. So, uh, Chuck, put your, um, 
Chuck, put your year of birth in here. I'm sure Brad can find you one. Currently yeah, waiting for Colorado radio station passion. If you if you uh, put your date of birth in, also tell me what what you enjoy. Do you like rules or do you like results? Are you passionate or are you oh, just somebody who's like you know I'm obey the funny. rules? That'll help. So uh, I swear I swear we're to God, certainly going to keep these. People. I know we're going to keep all these questions because I think we can because we can you know um, we can certainly address them. There's I mean this was kind of our intro. Let's see what people want to talk about. What I hope people walk away with is that a conversation needs to happen, that the boomers aren't right, the Gen X don't have a handle on it, the millennials don't have a handle on it. And at some level, you know, while we might not be able to create a blood tribe, like you mentioned, Brandon, we might be able to create like a community tribe around people so that I'm investing in, you know, millennials and who live near me, even though our son's in Israel or our daughter's in Atlanta. Yeah. We don't live yeah. close anymore. And so if we can have a conversation where we can begin to understand each other, and Absolutely. accept each other. I'm hoping that's what we do here. Well, you know, look at me. My my wife is black and from Haiti. She speaks four languages. She makes me feel like an idiot. And I help raise her nephew. And uh, he's he's mixed as well. And he is the quintessential millennial. He plays on video games, but he is so smart. It's mind blowing. So it, we're going to cover a lot of bases in the next couple of weeks. I hope everybody's excited and you tune in again and watch because we're going to be reposting. I think we're doing two shows on Friday. Am I right, Susie? Yeah, on Friday we're doing two shows. Mm -hmm. Nice, good. I good. think two and two and three o'clock, so we can really cover a lot. Um, what I would love for people to do, you know, I I don't know enough about Blab to know if some of these questions are going to get saved with the radio, the replay save. This is still sure. me not being technical. So if not, Brad, is there an email they can use to, to post questions to us? Yes, please. Uh, you can either direct message either one of us on Twitter. You have our Twitter. That's a great idea. You came yeah. from Blab. That's a great idea. You can email me directly at Brad at liquidleadership.com. Brad at liquidleadership.com. And I'll put it in the notes right now. Okay. Or me at... So they're saying, yeah, you can follow the chat stream on the replay. Yes, okay, good. Because I want to address some of these questions when we get back on. Well, I think the best thing, too, I mean, these questions, some of them are topics in their own. Oh, God, yeah. Yes. We're going we're gonna to yeah. do a deep dive. And it's all based on my business book, Liquid Leadership, uh, You know, because I started to peel back the layers, and it got kind of scary. And I was like, whoa, do I want to show enough of this to the business public? Because they're not going to get it. And boomers used to sit in the back of the room when I used to do keynotes like this. Now everybody's like, oh, my God, what do we do? Uh, it's a big issue. It's a big issue. Yeah, Are I you think typing it again? I'm I think the great thing about this right now is you guys are addressing and bringing it up to front because even yesterday I was in a network meeting and there was a mother there that has a, a young, I'd say she's probably about 18 year old nephew that they're working with and they're mm -hmm. so confused of how to work with them. Well, yeah. you know, he's not doing the schooling and he's not doing that. He's always trying to go against them and he's very creative, but I don't think that's going to help him, but he needs to get a job. And there still needs to be education like you guys are providing to say, okay, hold on. You know, there's okay. a different way to talk to them, to understand, to appreciate there their value. Very different way to talk to them. And, I, and I'm hoping by the time we're done with this, millennials will also know how to uh, have a better grasp on parenting for their kids as well. Because the next generation is right. going to scare all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to, I, I can't wait to share the story about our son and some of the conversations he's had with his dad. But if you have questions, I know we're, we're almost at our time. Battle is the kids getting interested. Post your questions, send them to us. You know, I know not real. I don't know even know your name. Not NH for real. Asked about using Gen X in the title. I'm not big on titles and labels. You know, we had to come up with something to, you know, really position it. So, Brad, is there a reason we don't have Gen X in the title? Is it is there uh, such a what? huge difference between millennials and Gen Xers? Uh, there can be. It depends. But uh, I'll put it in the next time because, uh, yeah, I don't want anybody to feel excluded. But at the same time, uh, I do have if you email me, I have a um, uh, a blog I did with Todd Churches on what I think uh, Gen X needs to do. So they don't wind up being the Jan Brady of the generations, you know, stuck in the middle going, why is millennials getting all the attention, which is happening right now. Boomers are tripping over Gen X to shake hands with millennials out of fear. 
And uh, I don't like that as well. I think Gen X is ready for management and they're being ignored. So uh, I'm going to show you how to speak up a little bit. We're going to kick some butt. Um, but yes, service thank you address. For make sure you make sure you email Brad. I'm going to service address. You make sure you email Brad because you say I wish I could jump on as a generation. Definitions really need to be resolved. I um, Chef Sarek said something about apathy or Steve the Yeti. To me, I don't think it's apathy as much as it's uncertainty because I think there's a desire that existential angst that we didn't actually have the luxury of feeling. I really think that's what it is. I mean, I'm not saying that all yeah. of them are that way and that apathy exists, but those are some questions we can really dive well, into. And if you're a millennial, talk to us. Well, guess what? The next three that we're going to do, first we're going to talk about Star Wars and science fiction. That's our next blab and how that influenced the mind. One, they're raised on Doogie Howser. Hello. The second blab that we're going to do after that is going to be about how video games really influenced our culture and raised a new generation to be comfortable with digital, you know, manipulating digital information before they could read, write, or speak. And then the third piece we're going to uh, go into, the next blab, we're going to be really doing a deep dive into how parenting and child-centric teaching really change the self-esteem and the expectations of the next generation. So the next three blobs are going to be rocking and rolling because we're going to go into we're going to go into some of this and we're going to go mm -hmm. into some of this, you know, we're going to talk about this and uh, what's our favorite one is uh, Ender's Game. What was that? Ender's Game. Ender's Game is one of them. Yeah. We're going to talk about child centric parenting. We're going to talk about how the mixed messages came out. So Again, if you have questions, please post them. This is just a fun conversation to be having. Absolutely. And we're just really grateful that you all joined us today. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we keep, we'll keep you posted on the next blabs. And Brandon, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Brother. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. And your insights. Great insights. Thanks. It's, it's great. I mean, that's, this is one of the conversations that I constantly have with the people that I work with and around me. Right? And Brad, mm -hmm. knows kind of my background and my experience and who I work with. And that's just one of the things that a tribe. It's all of us working together to help each other. Yeah. It's true. It's so true. Great. Yeah. Some well, great points you. here, Karen Q, and we'll we'll make note of those. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. I don't know how, to, so I don't know how to end this, Brad. <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording.